Hi everybody and welcome to the second College and Research Libraries online forum. I'm very excited to welcome you here today and today's topic is creating a culture of assessment in academic libraries. Uh, my name is Sarah Steiner and I'm the social media editor for College and Research Libraries which means I have the distinct pleasure of putting these events together and I'm very excited about today's. And the function of these fora is to highlight college and research libraries uh, research that's coming out and we'll highlight it with a free live expert panel. Oops, sorry. Technical issue on the side, sorry. And these are your chance to engage with the authors of that study and also with other experts in that area. So today we have a really awesome panel for you. And uh, I just want to tell you that if you want to send questions, you can do that at any time. There is a URL that we're going to pop up right now. There it is. So you'll see the web form you can use to send any questions that you want to ask to today's speakers. You can also, if you're on Twitter, you can send us tweets and there is our hashtag and also our account so you can direct things at us. And we will also be watching our Facebook account so you can send us questions there. And just be aware that there is a 45 second delay between when we will be saying things and when you will actually hear them. So there may be a moment of delay from when you send your question to when we actually get it. So I just want to take a moment to introduce today's session moderator, and she is Megan Oakleaf, and she's an associate professor at the iSchool at Syracuse University, and her research areas include assessment, evidence-based decision-making, information literacy instruction, and reference services. So thank you very much for being with us, Megan, and we're just going to have our speakers introduce themselves briefly. Hi, I'm Amy Harris Halk. I'm a um, the Information Literacy Program Coordinator at University of North Carolina at Greensboro. I'm also a lecturer in the lecturer in the library school here. Um, my liaison areas are media studies, communication studies, religious studies, and philosophy. And my research interests include um, active learning, universal design for learning, and library instruction, and of course assessment. Um, so, hello everyone, Lisa Janicki Hinchliff here with only a photo, no video, sorry. Um, I am the, a professor and coordinator for information literacy services and instruction at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where I also teach as an adjunct in the library school, primarily teaching the course on academic librarianship. In addition, I am a past president of ACRL and my initiative when I was president was to establish the value of academic libraries initiative, which reflects very much um, the current focus of my research these days, um, which is on assessment, value, and continuous improvement in academic libraries. Hi, I'm Meredith Farkas and I am the uh, General Education Instruction Coordinator at Portland State University, and I am also a lecturer at San Jose State University's School of Library and Information Science. I write a column for American Libraries called Technology in Practice, and my research interests center on, not surprisingly, building a culture of assessment, um, but also instructional design and the impact of Web 2.0 technologies on teaching and learning. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So I, I guess I get to take over from this point. Um, this is Megan Oakleaf, and I'm very excited to have this panel. Uh, in front of you. I'm so excited that even though I had no voice at all this morning, I definitely did not want to miss it. So I apologize in advance for the state of my voice and I hope you can still understand me. Um, I decided I would uh, kick this off um, uh, with just a, a short statement of my interest in this particular article and this particular um, set of, of research that Amy, Meredith, and Lisa have done. And um, I, I prepared a statement because I wasn't sure if I was actually going to be able to do this. So I hope you'll indulge me um, as I just make a few comments about why I'm so excited to be here today and so excited to be um, facilitating this, this panel with these speakers. So as most of you know, or you probably would not have turned, uh, tuned in to begin with, establishing a culture of assessment in libraries has really been both a big goal and a bit of a bugaboo for at least a decade. 
Ten years ago, in 2004, Lacos and Phipps published their seminal work on this topic, a fantastic article published in Portal. As much as I love the article, and I, and I truly do, I'm going to get us started with the, our discussion today by defining a culture of assessment using the definition provided by Meredith, Lisa, and Amy's article, because it is absolutely spot on, in my opinion. They define a culture of assessment as um, they define a culture of assessment as one where assessment is a regular part of institutional practice. It is a core part of what the library does, just like materials acquisition or reference service. Consequently, it is well supported and integrated throughout everything a library does. When a new service is planned, planned for, part of the planning will include examining existing data and determining how the new service will be assessed. Assessment is not something the organization does because of external pressures from the institution or accrediting bodies. It is something the organization does because librarians and staff want to better understand library users and how they can improve services and collections to meet user needs. When assessment becomes the norm and is no longer seen as something extra, it has become part of the culture. I love that. I think it's, I think it's perfect. It's something I'll be calling out uh, in presentations that I do in the future. Uh, but by, you know, uh, I think they would all acknowledge that that is um, not a definition of culture of assessment that is uh, small. It's very rigorous in its de definition of what a culture of assessment is. And so, in some ways, I'm not sure that some of the respondents to the survey that we'll be discussing in the next hour had this full picture in mind when they said that they did or did not have a culture of assessment in their library. Um, and my intuition and experience tells me that this kind of culture of assessment is not as common maybe um, as we would like it to be. Uh, but I don't want to scoop our panelists on this point, um, so I'll pretty much leave it at that. I'll, I'll let them discuss any dissonance between how many librarians responded that they do have a culture of assessment in their library and whether or not that assessment culture that they claim to have is as all-encompassing as the one we've just described. But at any rate, the definition that they've given is what we all should be shooting for. In the past, I've argued often and, and loudly, louder than today, uh, that assessment is a core skill, a core practice, even a core value of librarianship. However, establishing a true culture of assessment, as Lisa, Meredith, and Amy define it, is no easy thing. At the same time, it's absolutely necessary for library success, and by extension, the success of our users. If academic librarians exist to make differences in the lives of our users, and we work really hard on our services and our collections and resources that we hope will help, um, we, but we never, and if we never really check to see that we're making a difference to the users as, ag as individuals and in the aggregate, what does that mean? So if we say we want to do this but we don't do it, what does that mean? At best, it's a fool's approach. At worst, it's a major vector to failure. So by extension, if we conceive of library value as the library's ability to help our institution meet its missions, goals, and strategic priorities, and if we don't conduct reflective and rigorous assessments, how can we possibly argue that we're providing value? How can we possibly communicate that value with real evidence? In any case, establishing cultures of assessment in our libraries is incredibly important. But how do we create that true culture of assessment? How do we support and nurture it? Conversely, what might we be doing inadvertently or otherwise to undermine it? In the past, we've relied mostly on anecdotes and case studies to answer those questions in libraries. In my own practice and research, I've tended to avoid those sources of evidence, anecdote and case study, for the most part. And instead, I've used the literature of higher education overall as an initial source for conceiving of facilitators and barriers for assessment, starting with the publications of Marilee Bresciani and others who have written for the last 10 to 15 years on that topic. They write about what helps and what hurts when it comes to doing assessment work. But of course, the focus of that literature is on academic faculty and higher education assessment professionals. So then I had to augment what I learned from them with my own experiences in libraries. A, uh, I, th I, I felt comfortable at that point doing it this way, but I'm very relieved to have um, some real research, systematic research to go on. So now, yay, we have that research. We have a great study focused only on libraries and librarians. It's very exciting. The article we're discussing today really kicks off what I hope is a new area of research that we can pursue over the coming years. 
I know the authors have invited interested colleagues to help with further analysis of their data, and discussions like we're having today are a great way to start off all this uh, new emphasis and focus in this area. Okay, so I hope that I didn't just make your uh, own throat itch and your eyes water from listening to that. Um, thank you for indulging me in my, in my uh, sort of limited voice here today. Um, but what I do want to do now is turn it over to the panelists who all have uh, actual working voices to answer your questions. Uh, I'm going to start with some um, questions that um, I have on my list. And as we get additional questions from you as the audience, we'll all be filtering those in as we get them. Um, so please uh, uh, work with me on that by sending us lots of good questions. So the first question is this. Uh, could you please tell us a bit about the scope of your study and also the methodology that you used in the study? Sure, I can speak to that. Um, and maybe I should start by talking about sort of how why we decided to do this study and it started when I was a new librarian here at Portland State and was you know trying to build a culture of assessment I was an instruction new instruction coordinator and um, you know I kept spouting off these oh we need to do this to build a culture of assessment we need to do that and my dean said well could you show me some evidence in the literature of um, what it takes to build a culture of assessment in libraries and so I started you know I had already read some stuff but I I hadn't realized that basically everything I'd read for the most part was either very small samples um, of usually people who were into assessment or were case studies and while those are fantastic and you can learn so much from them um, you know it was it was not the kind of stuff that I think my director was looking for so at the same time, Lisa and Amy and I were um, met at um, um, ACRL Immersion, the assessment track, and we were all very interested in this question. So we really wanted to look at what factors facilitate the creation of an assessment culture. And instead of you know looking at librarians um, and asking li you know all librarians to answer, we really wanted one person from each library to amp to respond to this. Um, we sent an email to every director that we could get um, an email address for at um, all four year and above academic libraries in the US and I can't remember the exact number of how many we sent it to. I think it was like 16, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 1600 and is that right? <laughs> I think that might have been what you got back. It may have been 1,800, 1,600. Anyway, uh, we it's started with 1,600. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. <laughs> so we sent out 1,600 emails to directors at four year and above academic libraries in the U.S. and we asked them to give the survey to whoever is most responsible for assessment or instructional assessment at their library. Um, and in some cases, that's the director in some cases that's you know an instruction librarian you know in some places an, an assessment coordinator all different levels um, and we said it that only one person at each institution could fill out the survey so the link was unique um, so that we didn't get a lot of people from one institution filling it out and the survey itself contained um, a bunch of demographic questions about each institution and then um, asked about the presence or absence of 16 facilitating factors and whether the presence or absence of those factors um, helped or hindered the library in building an assessment culture. And we came up with the list of facilitating factors basically from what we read in um, the existing literature um, on what people have said it takes to build a culture of assessment in libraries. Super, okay, so what does the landscape then look like in academic libraries today, the landscape of assessment? Ah, well in some ways I found it to be better and in some a lot more depressing <laughs> than I was expecting. Um, you know, I, I didn't really know what to expect, I don't think any of us did, and we found that you know 59% of respondents reported that their library has a culture of assessment, and that didn't significantly change among Carnegie classifications. I kind of thought it would. I kind of thought the that PhD granting institutions, you know, research institutions would be doing more um, with assessment, but that wasn't borne out certainly in our in our results at least. Um, 
we found that 85% of libraries operate um, in an institution that already has a campus-wide assessment push, which is certainly um, very helpful for libraries. 78% um, of libraries say that assessment is a priority of administration, though I found that many of the things that you'd expect to see associated with making that a priority didn't really have as high a percentage. You know, so sometimes I wonder if some of that, like, making it a priority is more of a, like, you go girl kind of support <laughs> um, rather than necessarily a um, the support you're expecting. Um, let's see. So we found that 58% report that administrators offer explicit support of assessment work versus the 78 who say assessment is a priority of administration. Only 59% say that their administrators use assessment data in decision making. Um, and only 56% say that their library has the in-house skills to actually conduct meaningful assessments and actually um, do the analysis. So I found that really interesting. You know, obviously a lot of administrators value assessment, but they may not have actually operationalized that um, in how in, in the library. Um, another thing that was really interesting was that although most administrators value assessment, many haven't developed any sort of plan or clear expectations for doing assessment. We found 46% say that their library has clear expectations and 41% say that their library has an assessment plan. So that's even below the 59% who say their library has a culture of assessment. Um, and of the libraries that had neither of those facil facilitating factors, only 30% of them reported having a culture of assessment. So clearly um, not a lot of libraries have an assessment plan, but that is a really critical element of building an assessment culture. And it, it definitely was clear to us that administrators need to do more than just say assessment is important to build an assessment culture. It really has to be operationalized throughout what the library does and the skills that are built through um, library staff and faculty. Great, great. So is there anything else that you learned about the role of leadership in building a culture of assessment? So I think one of the things that I would reflect on um, is that one of the things that this kind of study doesn't necessarily tell us is what led to what. <laughs> so we do know, for example, that there were these things that were more highly correlated, but we don't know if it's more likely that administrators use data and that creates a culture of assessment or because there's a culture of assessment, administrators are more likely to use data. We just don't know which way that goes. Now some of them we can be a little confident on because there's a, a huge correlation between which accrediting body your institution is accredited by and your library having a culture of assessment. And I think it's very unlikely that the library having a culture of assessment created the accreditation relationship that the institution has. So we can, on some of those, get the logic going in a way that makes sense. So I think what we sort of can say about the role of leadership is that overall we can see that these are all factors that play into a culture of assessment. And so if some of them are causal and some of them are a result of, um, really probably what we have is a complex ecosystem at play. And as leadership is saying at least what the vision is for what kind of organization we're trying to create um, and whether it means sort of working more in the abstract way of championing that idea of culture or if it means saying here are the practices that I can control as a leader and implement in my decision making both of those would be valuable because we found evidence that both bottom-up and top-down approaches are influential in the culture of assessment in academic libraries. Great, great. So some of those things you might expect, um, uh, were there any, was there anything that was really sort of a big surprise for you guys? Um, one of the biggest ones that I, the thing that I had expected to be sort of a factor in either hindering or helping a library build a culture of assessment was tenure status and faculty status because we often 
we often say, oh, because, you know, faculty status is so important because we can work more closely with faculty, we're treated like an, more like an academic unit and held to the same expectations with regards to assessment. Um, and I was kind of, and I mean, all those things are still true, but I was surprised to find that there was no um, significant difference between librarians with tenure status and librarian libraries that didn't have tenure status in terms of um, whether they were able to build a culture of assessment or not. And the same was true of li librarian libraries where librarians have faculty status and libraries where they don't. Um, so that was a big surprise, and uh, we found in a lot of the um, open-ended responses, people were saying, oh, tenure has made us more research-oriented, so we do more assessment, and other people were saying, oh, tenure has kept us from doing assessment because we don't have any time because we're always doing research. So it was very interesting to see that not quite borne out in the, um, in the results. And also, um, I don't know if it was really that surprising, but... Um, just how important having a campus-wide assessment initiative was. Um, at libraries that do not have a campus-wide assessment initiative, only 38% of those libraries report having an assessment culture. So clearly, you know, I don't, you know, I think that's another one where we can kind of look at it as it's probably causal because what are the odds that the library is making the campus have a campus-wide assessment initiative. I know there were, are some libraries that can pull that off, but it's usually coming from above. And I think it's, you know, it's great to see how many universities do have a campus-wide assessment initiative, and libraries seem to be benefiting from that. And the third factor, um, I think I'm going to let Amy speak to, because she is one of the lucky people from um, one of the accrediting agencies that has um, such a high number of libraries with an assessment culture. Yes, and I'll just say that um, I've, I've, have, I've had some very fresh experience with my accrediting body. Um, so yes, one thing that we saw is that um, librarians from schools that are accredited by either SACs or middle states, more SACs than middle states, um, were found to have, you know, be more likely to have a culture of assessment. And um, as Lisa pointed out just a few minutes ago, um, it's unlikely that the library's culture of assessment has, you know, affected the accrediting bodies. Um, but I can say, you know, I, we had our an on-site visit about three weeks ago, and I was heavily involved with both the campus-wide assessment and library assessment things leading up to that. And I, I think that it's it's very real that the priorities of the accrediting body um, make their way into, of course, the campus, but also the library as far as assessment goes. So um, that was that that wasn't particularly surprising to me, but I was surprised at how how much more likely people um, at SACS schools were to have consider themselves as having a culture of assessment. Oh yeah, it was a full. It was a full. You know order of magnitude larger. I mean, uh, at NWCCU, which is um, who accredits my library, 40, we have 49% for, of libraries at NWCCU institutions have a culture, report having a culture of assessment, whereas 73% of SACS institutions. That's amazing. It is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> location, location, location. So um, one of the things that we talk a lot about in, in assessment circles is the idea of closing the loop, right? Using assessment results to make decisions uh, and take actions. So you know, to what degree does that part fill, uh, build into a good culture of assessment? Well, I think that this the whole idea of closing the loop is is huge, and I think that the you know its importance can't be overstated. Um, in the, the survey, 283 librarians reported that staff and administrators at their libraries use data to make decisions, and 85% of those librarians reported having a culture of assessment. So, um, you know, it seems pretty clear from that that those two things are, are very strongly related, and I mean, as a librarian in the field, um, I think that 
librarians are far more likely to, you know, be willing to do assessment and, and do all these things that, you know, create a culture assessment if they know that the assessment that they're doing can actually affect things and, and help people do their jobs better and, um, you know, help students learn and all those sorts of things. So I think that that closing the loop and, and knowing that what you're doing matters is incredibly important. Great, great. Well, I, I'm I'm glad to hear it. It would be it would be sort of sad if it was the opposite. That's that's a relief to me. I would have to really revise some of my thinking. <laughs> um, so speaking of um, you know things that we can take away from this, what is what's some of the takeaway advice that you might have for viewers who want to build a culture of assessment at their library? Um, well, I mean, as with most things that we do in libraries, I think that buy-in is everything and I think that being clear about what the assessment cycle is and why assessment is important is you know is really important and can help librarians get you know excited and we are really lucky to have a lot of great you know models out there such as the ILLIAC model thank you Megan Oakleaf um, that is a really great way to you know just sort of visualize the assessment process and how it works and you know what happens to this data that we collect um, so I think that that is super important I also think that having a plan, having a well articulated plan um, that lots of people have had input on that is available um, for people to see and, and revisit periodically is, is really important as well. And um, although in the, the study there wasn't an incredibly strong correlation to this, I think that supporting professional development is really important, especially in this day and age. Um, I think that we're kind of in a place in libraries where if a library is willing to put money into something, it must be important. And I think that, you know, seeing that the library really supports professional development such as immersion and, and other, um, you know, attending conferences and things like that is really important to show that that's something that the library values. Okay, I'm going to interject with a, um, uh, a question we just got in from the audience. Here's the question. You guys ready? Sure. Um, please suggest where to start. When my first library job, my first job out of library school, positioned me within a community college library that has not conducted inventory in the last seven years, and where faculty are not engaged in curriculum assessment for some of the college flagship programs. The most unbelievable to me is that reference calculation is done by a check system. Well, in grad school, I use my lab guide and all of the SpringShare products. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, oh. Lisa. Okay, great. Yeah, we were having a little... Uh, so I think this is a great example of how, um, regardless of what the overall patterns are in the study that we did, which really honestly give a lot of hope because um, at least, you know, there's a high percentage of people perceiving their libraries as having a culture of assessment. Um, the individual experience of a particular person may or may not be that uh, same perception. And also, you know, we should be really honest and say up front, as uh, Meredith did, that our study was only at four-year schools and um, four-year colleges, universities, and community, uh, so not the community colleges at this point. Um, but, you know, this question of well, where do you start if you come into a place that doesn't have a culture of assessment is really what a lot of individuals are facing. Um, and so th what some of the things I would, would think about personally is I always look to try and find somewhere that that assessment is happening. So this can be really a challenge when you see so many of the things that aren't happening, but it's much easier typically to start by praising and building on something that's going well rather than pointing out all the things that aren't going well. So, um, you know, obviously if we're tracking our reference questions, we at least care to know how many we're answering and is there a possibility of adding to that something that says, well, what kind of questions are these? And then even a self-reflection on well, how well do I think that question was answered? Or can I categorize the student experience of the, the, the type of question that the student asked me on, say, Bloom's taxonomy for complexity or just any of the other ways that we might go about this? 
um, thinking about that. The other thing I think that an individual can do is think about, well, what are those areas where I can act? And typically, our own instruction sessions are places that we can act. And even if we can't report our data out for it to be used in a bigger way, we can use formative assessment in instruction to improve our own practice. So even if it's a library tour, you can think about how halfway through the tour you might take a moment to do a pause procedure and ask a question of the people who are on the tour about what they've learned so far that was most useful to them. Hear those answers in the moment and at least use it to craft your next part of your tour. That's very formative, it's small, it's the beginning of starting to do this and then sharing that with your colleagues. But this is obviously not a um, that's not going to cause prescriptive and radical overnight change. That's going to be um, focusing on the things that I can do as an individual person in the environment in which I found myself. And I'm thinking all of us have those areas where we'd like to see our libraries do more. So partially I always start with where can I identify the beginning of practice that we can improve rather than just critique the things that we're not yet doing. That's a great point. I would also add that I know a lot of people are turned off by assessment because they find it very overwhelming. And I think starting, and there's this great article that talks about um, assessing where the light is best um, so that you're starting with the things that are easy to measure, um, you know, whether that's doing a minute paper in a class or things that are small and provide big benefits still. You know, you don't need to create the perfect um, assessment that you're going to give in every single class, you know, maybe just something that provides insight. And I think as people start doing these small assessments, they might start to internalize the value of assessment and realize that it's really about learning and not about, um, you know, saying that they're a bad, you know, they're doing a bad job or, or judging them in some way. You know, it's not really about accountability. It's about learning. That's great. That's great. I, 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 we need to get that citation for that article that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, so, Lisa, you, you sort of alluded to the four-year uh, college versus community college environment. Um, do you have anything else you could add about co community college libraries? I think that you might. Yes. Um, yes, please. If you are a community college librarian, please watch your email starting next week. It, well, I guess it's a week after the last uh, last two weeks of April. Uh, we'll be releasing our next survey in the series that we're working on, where we'll be asking community college library to respond to these same questions about a culture of assessment and the way that their libraries are engaging with assessment activities within their institutions. Um, so we look forward to seeing um, the results of that. And actually, I can also say that we have been accepted to present the results of that paper at um, the Library Assessment Conference in Seattle in August. And so we look forward to sharing those results. And we do know that um, obviously community colleges are a very important part of the landscape of higher education in the United States. So do, do know that our, we always intended to have a study of community colleges. We just could only manage so many responses in our first time out with this survey. Um, but it made us really gratified to be able to say that, yes, we think this survey can work for community colleges as well. So, uh, yeah, so stay tuned and, and, and answer the survey, everyone. <laughs> right, so add to that data set. So I can only imagine, um, as I read the article the first time, I thought, oh my gosh, so many questions, so many institutions, what a treasure trove of data to, to look through and mine and, and explore relationships in. So. Um, you know, what's what's the status with that? Is, is the data set available for other researchers to analyze? Yes, and um, it does say on an, our article that um, they can email me if they'd like a copy of the data set because with our IRB, you know, we can't just make it um, publicly available, but we can share it with researchers. And, you know, we are very passionate about um, assessment and building a culture of assessment, but like many librarians, our data analysis skills are not um, super amazing, and I would love it for some people with, you know, really amazing data analysis skills to take a look at what we've 
what we've got here because it's such an amazing data set. I mean, we have a we got a 42% response rate, which is just nearly unheard of in the um, literature. So it would be great. Yes, actually, let me say here that um, we really want to say thank you to all of our colleagues out there who answered the survey here. Yeah. I will. We were working with the Survey Research Lab here at the University of Illinois to advise us on the survey construction, and they kept asking us, "What kind of incentives are you giving people?" Because <laughs> they they just could not believe the level of participation, especially when we told them that the the only incentive we promised people was the opportunity to contribute to our professional understanding. And so I think really what this tells us. I mean, this isn't in our data. This is something I would con confer or I would infer from our experience that really, as a profession, we've moved a long way as sort of collectively agreeing that this is an important part of our practice and is what it means to be a responsible uh, professional. And it's that we want to know how well we're doing. And I think that's really what accounts for that amazing level of participation and really the gratitude we have to everyone because the results here are because of those hundreds of people who took the time to fill out the survey. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to share this knowledge as a field. Yeah, you're all amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to point out, I just got a note from Scott Walter saying that uh, College and Research Libraries as a publication does um, have the possibility of hosting open data or linking to data in an institutional repository. So he wanted to make sure I made a note of that. Um, and I think uh, that's also useful for those of us who may be publishing in his journal in the future, or at least uh, aspire to. Yes, think about this before you do your IRB. This is, I think, what we learned from this experience, um, that we just did not phrase our IRB in a way that would allow us to share it because we really did want to do that and um, so think ahead. <laughs> Lessons learned, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, and I, I also want to reinforce uh, Lisa's message about um, their presentation at the Library Assessment Conference. Um, we've got a great slate of, of publications on assessment coming up there in, in, in August and when the call for registration goes out very shortly, you'll want to make sure you jump on that because it does fill up uh, has filled up every year uh, or every conference in the past. Um, so keep that in mind. All right, so I mean it's very clear to me how all of this work initiate or integrates with other ACRL initiatives, not least of which being the value initiative which so many of us have worked hard on. Um, would you like to speak to some of those intersections? Sure, I mean I think one of the things that we um did see in our data, especially in a number of the open-ended comments, is how important professional development has been for librarians as they have worked to develop their skills and abilities, as well as to do organizational development around um, database decision making and using evidence for improving of practice. So obviously, um, there's a number of things that ACRL has been doing for quite some time, sort of with a signature program these days under the value of academic libraries and that, that initiative. The committee that is currently overseeing that initiative is being wonderfully chaired by Terry Fischel of McAllister College. Um, and they have so many things on their agenda that they're working on, including working with the ACRL Liaisons Committee for those liaisons that go out to other professional associations in higher education to help them articulate this value proposition for how we are working within the higher education community. Of course, ACRL has a number of publications, um, some of them, uh, many of them in this area without charge. Uh, the report that Megan wrote uh, under under contract for ACRL and was uh, kicked this off in 2010. Uh, the white paper that followed up on it. Um, some things that aren't necessarily published as with the title value or assessment, but I think of some of the more recent publications like ACRL's white paper on open educational resources, the intersections of scholarly communication and information literacy. All of these have a strong message of the importance 
importance of using data in our decision making and thinking carefully about how we create value for our organizations. Um, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the ACRL Immersion Program Assessment Immersion and applications are still being taken for people to participate this coming fall in November, um, which is where um, Megan and Amy, or sorry, Meredith and Amy and I. Um, you know, found our common passion for this, so it's kind of a fun connection for us. And then, of course, we have the ACRL Assessment in Action project that's going on. We just closed the applications, unfortunately, for people to participate in this coming year. However, you'll see next February again another call for the third year. So lots of opportunities, and I guess the other thing I would add to that is ACRL is always looking for other people to step up to a leadership role with this. So if there are things people want to join in by contributing as a leader themselves in ACRL, I know ACRL definitely wants to hear from those folks. Okay, so I want to get back to a point that was made earlier in the program and see if we can probe a little bit more in this area. Um, so we, we called out, uh, we named names, we mentioned that SACS does a, 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 seems to have a, a good influence on the uh, likeliness of, of an, a culture of assessment in their libraries. So what is it, do you think, um, if you could guess or uh, in, more, in a more educated way, respond to the, the idea of what does SACS do differently than other accreditation bodies that helps foster that assessment culture? Well, that's, I think that's a really good question, and I've been sitting here trying to, to figure out what the answer is. Um, I have been here at UNCG, which is a SACS institution, for nine years, and since I... All I can say, kind of my, my N equals one, my experience, is that um, over the past probably five or six years, um, there has just been more, um, more emphasis on assessment campus-wide from SACS. Um, so I have been part of, for example, a campus committee that is charged with, okay, you ready for this, assessing the assessment plans of every program on campus. Okay, so it's very uh, meta. Um, so, you know, we have a rubric, we assess these assessment plans for things like, you know, measures and closing the loop and all those sorts of things, reporting results to stakeholders, because those are the things that SACS has said are important. And um, I'll never forget the day when the chair of this committee looked at me during one of the meetings and says, who's assessing your assessment program in the library? And that was that was a, a defining moment in my life because I realized that nobody was really assessing our assessment program and we had had headed toward making an assessment program but we weren't really there yet and so that led me to be a lot more intentional about you know thinking about assessment and what an assessment plan might look at look like because everybody else on campus was having to do it. So um, that that has been just my experience um, at a, a SACS school, and I don't know if anybody has anything else that you would like to add to that. So I would add as somebody who's not at a SACS school but has been looking a lot at issues of accreditation um, with information literacy assessment in particular uh, for a book chapter that I'm working on, that I think that SACS has two additional characteristics that I'm not sure if they're wholly unique, but they are certainly coming into this. One is SACS has a high expectation for broad campus involvement in assessment. So it's not sufficient for there to be a singular sort of office of institutional research that does all of this for everyone else. So they're looking for a broad level of involvement, which of course then drives opportunities for librarians to get involved. And even at non-SACS institutions, we found that librarians who were involved with campus activities around assessment were more likely to say there was a culture of assessment in the library. So there's environmental factors going on whether you're at SACS or not, but clearly SACS drives campuses to act in certain ways. That's of course the whole point of accreditation. The other thing that is true in a SACS in the SACS structure that I think really highlights the importance of improvement and institutional transformation is what they call the QEP, 
the Quality Enhancement Plan, which each institution is required to identify a key focus area that as an institution it will commit to working on. And so, for example, I know a number that over time have actually identified information literacy as a key campus priority. Or they will do uh, have a priority of something like we will focus on student retention or first generation student success. This kind of singular focus for a campus to focus on as an area of improvement, and I want to be really clear that it has to be an area of improvement. A quality enhancement plan identifies a problem and then has the campus work to solve that collectively is an example of having the whole campus work on a singular project together. So again, I think you're seeing then bigger buy-in. You're seeing a campus-wide emphasis on continuous improvement. And so I think if I were to say those are, I think, are two of the signature things with respect to SACS. Now, the problem is obviously for the rest of us, we can't be like, hey, you know what, let's just give up our North Central and go to Sachs because of course it's geographically determined. So the lessons I personally took from this is in some ways less about what Sachs does per se, since I'm not at a Sachs institution, and more about the importance of looking for the opportunities where there is a campus level commitment whether it's in the general education program, maybe it's in the study abroad program, maybe it's I don't know where, but wherever there is that campus involvement, getting connected with that can help the library contribute to the campus culture, but also help build the internal library culture. Because if nothing else, as Amy just pointed out, by serving on this campus committee, she's gaining a lot of skills. She's learning how other people's assessment plans are assessed. You can't help but bring that knowledge back into your own work. So I'm going to combine some of these questions to make sure we get as many covered in the amount of time we have remaining. So one of the, 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 a few questions from the audience have sort of gotten to this, this sort of main idea of, based on your research results, what is your uh, best advice for either administrators or assessment coordinators uh, in libraries to support the building of a culture of assessment? What's your, what's your, your, your maybe laundry list, grocery list of steps that they can take to help build a culture of assessment? I'd like to speak to the um, assessment coordinator or instruction coordinator piece because that's certainly the one that's near, n nearest and dearest to my heart. Um, and coming in new to an institution or into a new position that's really focused on assessment, I think you really need to first look at your environment. And I think looking at those that list of facilitating factors we have and seeing maybe which ones your library already has, which ones it doesn't, um, politically who supports assessment, um, testing the waters about what anxiety might exist amongst librarians about assessment, what support administration is willing to provide, because you don't want to be in a position where you're burning all of your political capital um, as an individual on like this one-man mission, because assessment, you can't build a culture of assessment as a single person. And you really need, whether it's um, support from above or a coalition of instruction librarians or librarians across the institution who are passionate about assessment, um, either way, you, you need more than just you know, the Lone Ranger taking, taking on this kind of daunting task. And I would just, I just want to second what Meredith just said, also as an instruction coordinator, um, buy-in, like I said previously, buy-in is, is key. I mean, without having colleagues, you know, to buy into the whole idea of assessment and why it's important, it, it's basically, I think, impossible um, to create this culture. And I think that, um, speaking for myself, I think a lot of instruction coordinators don't have authority necessarily, so we kind of exist and we are seen as support people, but we can't sorry to say it this way, but we can't make people do assessment. Um, so we have to really kind of take their hands and, and show them why it's important because um, we're typically not in the position to say, look, you have to assess your classes because I think this is important. So it's really important to definitely, you know, find who um, who supports you and um, try to get those people started and, and just talk a lot about why this is important and why we're doing this and hopefully um, the people will follow you. 
Any other ideas on this point? So I think one of the things that is, um, I mean, I, I keep going back to this, but you know, really thinking about, well, what can I do in my own practice that models this for people? So if I'm trying to be a contributor to the culture, you know, obviously I can be looking to other people to do things, but looking to myself and saying, how am I showing people and how am I showing people that data is useful in decision making? So, so many times I think assessment gets, um, gets, <laughs> where's the burden of problem? So we do assessment in order to determine that there's a problem. And really what we do assessment to do is to say how close are we to meeting the goals that we have. Because if we're not meeting them, then of course we want to change because we wanted to set these goals out in the first place for something. So I think really that is an important part of this for me that I think I hadn't, I've only sort of come to realize more and more as I look at how institutions struggle with this, just the importance of sort of doing small things even in my own practice, even if they don't yet fit with a larger culture, because really larger cultures are built up of small practices. Okay, great. And I would also just like to um, call everyone's attention to my favorite figures in the article, which are four, seven, and eight. If anyone else is interested in which ones I like the best, those are the ones, and I think they really do go a long way towards speaking to that question as well. Um, okay, so I have uh, another question from the audience. Uh, she writes, or he writes, I'm wondering if the panel has any advice or insight for libraries that do have a culture of assessment but struggle, struggle with changing the data points and artifacts. Should we strive for a culture of assessment that is singular and isolated? How can we attain a more longitudinal perspective of assessment? So I think this is a great opportunity to think about, well, you know, is culture something that you it's sort of like a vaccine and like once you have it then you know you'll never use lose it again or is culture something that is continuously built and rebuilt over time and for me the the hallmark of sort of a culture of assessment with respect to this particular question of like these data points those artifacts whatever is is that ability to reflect as a group or as an organization upon whether these particular data points and artifacts are contributing to our ability to do continuous improvement um, and that they help us decide what we're going to do next. And now I'm not saying we should just sort of think about that briefly on a Tuesday afternoon and make a gut level reaction and suddenly stop collecting all of our ARL stats or something. But we should think about what what we are getting out of the, the data that we do have and if we're really using it as much as possible. To me, it's less the data points that you collect or whether you collect the same data points over time than whether you use the data that you collect. And so, um, but I think then what is pointed out here is is a culture of assessment exists within an organizational culture, and I think we could even um, uh, we could even say you know at some point somebody will need to decide whether there's a culture of assessment that's actually all that distinct from organizational culture. But um, you know, so to me, you know, going back to that definition where we're saying the point is that it's something we do because we want to understand how things are going. And if that data is still useful, we should still collect it and use it. But if that data isn't useful anymore, then we should have a way of, as Amy was just talking about, assessing our assessments in order to say, are these still the useful ones for us? OK, so in addition to utility, I'm, I'm sort of merging in another question here. In addition to the utility of whether or not we can use the data to uh, make decisions, take action, um, what are some of the other ways we can determine what areas of assessment are most vital? We have a small staff and have to make really hard decisions. Once we narrow it down to things we can take action on, is there another uh, criterion that we can use for that decision making? I would start by thinking about what questions you have as, as a group of librarians. You know, do you wonder if your reference services are effective? Do you wonder what students are getting out of instruction sessions? Do you wonder how usable your library website is? You know, I think 
coming from a place of curiosity and really starting with the questions that you have about your patrons and about the efficacy of your services is a really nice place to start. Maybe starting with the ones that are a little easier to get at than others because I mean some questions are much more difficult to answer than others and starting with the ones that are manageable you know usability testing or you know doing quick surveys at the reference desk or you know something like that is is rather manageable okay that's great I love that answer um, so another another uh, topic that keeps coming up in the questions and in sort of slightly different forms but the essential question is you know how can we communicate the importance of this assessment to students how do we get their um, their buy-in how do we tap into their more intrinsic motivations to take part in these uh, in assessments that we might uh, want to have them engage in either um, overtly like say through instruction or also um, less less obviously like through tracking individual data so how can we get students on board um, well I think that um, well first uh, there's a couple of things that I do um, I do a fair bit of kind of in-class as kind of just in time assessments and um, I think the most important thing is to keep it very short I think I cannot understate overstate the importance of that um, because of course you never want your assessment to take time away from what is actually important which is you know teaching um, but I do I, I like to tell students that you know the purpose why am I asking them these questions obviously this is not a grade but you know um, by your filling this out for me I can see you know what we need to spend more time on you know where we need to focus um, how to how I can improve my teaching um, and I just try to be very very clear about what the purpose is and um, if you can make it a game you know use a poll or something like that and they can see you know how they did um, that can really help so I think just keeping it fun while also explaining, um, you know, why it matters. I think students are kind of no different than almost everyone else, which is people are very willing to contribute if they believe that there is going to be a result for them. And I think that's what Amy was just sort of saying. And so I think that's the same thing if we are doing something like a user survey or LibQual or Ithaca survey, whichever of the many instruments that we might be using, which is that continuous feedback loop that says, because you told us X, we did Y. You told us ABC, we did XYZ. So somehow or another there needs to be that connection for people that the time I invest in helping the library is going to have an impact. Um, and so the it's a little easier sometimes in that 50 minute session because you can sort of say it to a group of people right there and if you do it even halfway through they can see the impact right away but I know there's a lot of institutions that for example if you go on the LibQual site there's a lot of institutions that have given their examples of how they have part of their LibQual marketing budget is not just to get people to take the survey but also to market back out to them here are the things we did because of what you told us so to me it's that closing that loop again that's really a matter of um, making sure that people are willing to participate okay super so we have about two minutes left I was hoping that each of you would give a, a couple closing thoughts uh, that you could you could share with us something you haven't gotten to say uh, yet that you want to make sure is reinforced um, well, however you want to use it sure um, I guess my my thing is that I wish there was a silver bullet you know that we could have taken from this to say oh this is the one thing you need to do and it will guarantee that your library will have a culture of assessment but it's clear that there isn't just one thing there's a variety of things but I think using these results to look at what facilitating factors your library has um, and figuring out how you can gain the facilitating factors that is that are really important to your library is going to make all the difference I mean we know having administrative support and word and deed is important having an assessment plan is important but but what is important at your library um, will probably be different than what's important, most important at my library. For me, this has given me a lot of, I mean, this, this 
all these results have made me very excited. I feel like we have come a long way in a relatively short amount of time, and I just think it's amazing that um, that libraries are making assessment part of their practice. And you know, whether it's because somebody is telling them that they have to, or whether it's just because they feel that it's important, um, I think that that is just a really amazing thing. And I feel like if we run this survey five years from now, that we would find that even more libraries have this happening and culture or assessment is becoming an even larger part of their culture. And so I just, I think that this has been, you know, just a great experience to see all the wonderful things that are happening across the country. And I would just add, um, for me, the biggest thing that came out of this, um, it was great to see in some ways the affirmation in the literature, right? I mean, these are the factors that the literature tells us should be part of a culture of assessment. It's nice to know that our literature is borne up with empirical testing. But the other thing that I came away with was just really a great sense of how the work that so many people has been have been doing for 10 or 15 years in some cases has really brought our field to a new place and I think you know we might as Megan alluded to at the beginning at sometimes question whether we are as robust in our practice as the number of percent of people that said um, you know said that they have a culture of assessment. On the other hand, to have that many people say, hey, we do have a culture of assessment, and then go on to say, you know, well, these are the areas that maybe we're not doing as well at, but we have a culture. To me, that claiming of culture is almost as important as to whether any particular practice is in place. So I'm, I think that is part of really the future and the exciting future of libraries is a group of people that are willing to say, you know what, we need to fully understand our users, we need to develop services that do what they need, and then we need to understand how well those services and collections are working for them so that we can make them better. I think that's quintessentially what it means to be responsible professionals and responsible academic libraries. So I took a huge amount of hope in our future from this kind of work. So well said. Thanks, you guys. So this has been really fun for me. That's great. Yeah, I just want to take a moment to close out and thank all our speakers uh, for coming today. That was a really amazing session, and I hope that all of you enjoyed it as much as I did. And uh, I will be sending a follow-up link shortly that will include a link to this preprint to the study that we've been talking about, which has been downloaded over a thousand times already since it was posted about six weeks ago. And um, You'll also receive a link to the recording of this session. And I just want to thank really quickly also uh, Scott Walter and Kara Mullen and David Free. Everybody has been working behind the scenes to make this event flow as smoothly as possible. And thanks again to all of you for coming, and I hope you have a great day.